Okay, so we've just started to record, and uh, as I was saying, it'd be really cool if someone gets enlightened on my shift, <laughs> but it's not really mine, so that's the issue, isn't it? If I'm here, then probably that won't work. <laughs> Good, so please make yourself at ease, and by doing that, we don't mean push your body around, we mean listen to your body, and ask your body how it wants to be positioned right now. <clears throat> treating your body not as a slave, but treating your body as a very precious vehicle for the path of awakening. Not despising the body or for its faults, its weaknesses, its sicknesses, its aches and pains. We're developing a sense of gratitude to have this human birth, this human life, and human mind is capable of looking within to understand the meaning of all of this. how we can make use of our lives, how we can incline our minds in a way that brings benefit to ourselves and other people, other beings, human or non-human. Beginning with living a harmless life. So just Developing that sense of gratitude towards your body and towards your mind. For giving you this opportunity to practice being kind. For the fact that you're living well already. Even though we all have our faults, we're taking steps each moment that we're mindful and we're kind. So I like to begin my meditation by just Getting a bird's eye view of my body sitting and noticing any areas where I'm still holding tension or tightness, scrunching up <clears throat> the brow, the shoulders. common places to hold that tension. And just inviting those areas to relax, those muscles to soften. As though receiving mental massage Smoothing out the tightness, the tension, giving those knots or any aches or pains space to work themselves out. Sometimes simply being aware of them is enough. When we add kindness, tend to gradually melt away.
And to take this a little bit deeper. I'd like to invite you to just imagine that you're soaking in the rays of the sunshine. The sunshine or the sunlight can be a synonym a metaphor for mindfulness and kindness combined. The sun is like the, the light. It contains both the light that illuminates whatever it shines upon. And along with that light is the warmth, the kindness. that soothes and opens things up. In the same way, you imagine walking through the forest and coming across a small little fern or piece of bracken curled up. And imagine the sunlight falling on that little fern so that you can see all the details. And the warmth of that sun slowly opening it up, allowing it to unfurl. In the same way, you can use this beautiful kindfulness to shine upon our body and mind, touching our skin, perhaps starting at the top of your head or your feet, wherever you prefer. For me, I prefer to start at the top of the head and imagine that sun soaking me through from top to toe. Warming the skin. Going in through the pores. And soaking into every cell of the body. All I need to do is sit and receive these beautiful, soft, gentle rays of kindfulness. Impatiently allow them to soak me through. Perhaps spending longer in any areas that are knotty or tight, where there may be some sickness, disease. Just relaxing. Allowing that little fern to unravel. To open up. So just gently moving down through your body. Just receiving any sensations you notice on this journey from head to toe. Oh. 
always being gentle, being kind. If you do come to any places in your body that feel hard to be with, see what kind of awareness feels most appropriate. Sometimes if our mindfulness and kindness is strong, we can move right into those difficult areas and Bless them, so to speak, or soak them up, soak them through with loving kindness, with care. Other times we may wish to widen the area of our awareness, giving them more space, allowing them to be, but also taking in the feelings and sensations that are easier, more agreeable and easeful. Keeping that perspective, keeping that container wide. Letting everything coexist. And as you keep on connecting to the world of feelings, bathing them with kindness, you start to move away from the thinking mind and notice perhaps some gaps between the thoughts. or a sense of space around the thinking mind. As though thoughts were just winds passing through the sky. And in the same way, you allowed kindness to permeate your body. See if you can extend kindness to the silence too. Appreciating any moment of peace as though this peace were a dear, 
valuable friend coming to visit you even for a moment and you don't want to miss a thing. And as you become acquainted with the silence, the quiet in the mind, it too starts to unfurl and reveal its beauty. Reveal something deeper and more meaningful than words. You realize you don't need to push the thoughts away. Just inclining to the space, the peace, the silence between the words. Enables that silence to grow. And as the mind rests into those moments of silence, it starts to energize, become bright and more aware. Perhaps you start to notice the breath. Or perhaps you notice more of the feelings in the body. Just allow the mind to incline towards wherever it finds the most peace. Maintaining a beautiful friendliness, kindfulness, towards any feelings in the body or towards your breath. 
not grasping any particular experience, but simply allowing experience to teach your mind. Be a resting place for your mind. It can carry you deeper and deeper inside towards simplicity, towards inner peace. Valuing each moment of kindfulness, each little part of the breath, however humble, however long it sticks around. This is a very precious and delicate friend. So all you need to do is be kind. So just notice how you feel now, how your mind feels, how your body feels, how your breath has changed or stayed the same. And if there is more peace, more ease, in the body and mind. Just reflect upon why. What did you do or perhaps not do that allowed things to settle and still? How did adding kindness to the way you were aware affect your experience?
And how does it feel just to be kind without expecting anything in return? So if you're enjoying your meditation, you don't need to open your eyes and let the world of sights back in. It's up to you. And even if you do choose to open your eyes, see if part of the mind can remain inside. Receptive. what's happening within. Receptive to whatever is being spoken about that resonates for you. I have a lovely bell here, but it might not make a very nice sound on Zoom. I'll give it a go anyway. <laughs> and if you wish, you can gently open your eyes, keeping that inner eye connected to your inner world. I can see my co-host saying that was very so so, but hopefully it was good enough, right? Like just like the meditation, good enough. <laughs> if it's good enough, we can be content. If it's not good enough, we're still craving and hoping and expecting and fixing things up. So there you go. That's the only bell you're going to hear unless you actually come to the one stream and you can hear its full resonance, which is very nice. <laughs> Great. So um. Yeah, I just left a little message in the chat box. So if any of you have not added a name to yourself in the box, if you could please do that whenever you're out of your meditation. If you want to continue, no hurry. But it just helps our co-host to identify you when you enter the waiting room. And uh, also helps us for the Q&A sometimes, the teachers. It's helpful for us to know Who's asking the question? We won't repeat it to anyone here, but uh, we know many of you. And sometimes they can just help, you know, there's some part of the mind that resonates with the energy of a person, even in a Zoom room. Not to say it will always be an appropriate response or a helpful response, but um, it just makes it a little bit more connected and appropriate. That's my experience anyway. Good, so we seem to have a lot of people here this evening, which is wonderful. And I really hope that you've enjoyed this first day. It's not over yet. And in England, it's still fairly early in the evening and really sunny and beautiful. So if things are going well, you can carry on. And uh, this evening, I wanted to uh, wait actually until Ajahn Brahm had given the morning talk uh, and see what might naturally follow on. And one of the things that uh, I picked up from, well, many things that I picked up from his talk, not least of which was his wonderful presence, inspirational energy and kindness as usual, which touched me really deeply today. Um, but also in the beginning of the meditation, he mentioned this little instruction of establishing mindfulness as a priority establishing mindfulness first of all and I wanted to talk about how this is even possible how do we actually establish mindfulness how does it arise before we even meditate it seems almost like uh, a kind of conundrum doesn't it you know establish mindfulness first before we meditate aren't we supposed to meditate to become mindful 
And the second part of it that I wanted to touch on is how can we make that mindfulness that we've established in the beginning really powerful and strong so that it does lead to this inner silence and even deeper into stillness and the profound happinesses and blisses of meditation as well. So one of my favorite subjects and you're not getting away without it this time, <laughs> is the importance of virtue on the path. And for me, this answers probably the first question at the very least. And in a sense, it can go all the way through to the second question too, because virtue is also something that refines itself. It becomes deeper as we um, develop in our practice. At first, we can think of virtue or ethics, morality, as something to do with the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that. I'm going to refrain from this. I'm never going to do that again. If I do it, it's terrible. I have to be good. But very rarely do we really focus on the beautiful, positive, uplifting sides of virtue and also take that into the level of the mind, the way we use our mind. And um, there's a really nice little sutta that I found this afternoon about virtue being a protector for us. And this is very relevant in the context, not only of establishing the meditation, but also protecting us through the process, through our entire life of practice, you know, to keep that foundation strong and to help us avoid any of the obstacles or even things like fear that can arise when we get deeper in our practice. So this little um, sutta, and I won't read the whole thing because it's from the Anguttara Nikaya tens, and that usually means there's 10 points. But the first point here is about virtue as a protector. So the Buddha says to the monks and nuns, and in fact, he addressed the senior most people in the assembly every time. So it was very likely that there were, as a lay community, there was a lay community present as well. So I'll just use the word community to translate the word bhikkhus. So community, live under a protector, not without a protector. One without a protector lives in suffering. And then he talks about 10 qualities that serve as a protector. So you can look this up later if you wish. It's anger to a 10, number 17. And this does relate to monastic life, but it can relate to lay life too, to some extent. So here, a monastic is virtuous. They dwell restrained by the patimokkha, possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing the danger in minute faults. Having undertaken the training rules, they train in them. And since this person is virtuous, possessed of good conduct and resort, seeing the danger in minute faults and training in those training rules, this quality serves as a protector. This is very beautiful, isn't it? And um, you know, this morning Ajahn Brahm talked about uh, really sort of condensing or um, I guess condensing that virtue down into two aspects to do things that cause no harm to oneself and no harm to others. In other words, to live a harmless life, yeah, a life of harmlessness. And of course, as soon as we have a harmless life, then other beings are protected. And we too are protected from harm. You know, People tend to feel safe around us. They tend to feel um, a disposition of kindliness towards us because they respect us, they feel safe, they feel at ease. And uh, this sense of safety is one of the gifts that we bestow upon others when we live a life of virtue. We live a life that allows others to feel at ease, allows them to feel that they belong, that they're respected and also loved. Mm -hmm. The other beautiful aspect, many aspects of virtue, but one other beautiful aspect is the aspect of contentment that virtue gives rise to because we start to simplify our lives. So again, Ajahn Brahm said this morning that the eight precepts is kind of an add-on to the five, and it's the aspect of simplicity, just learning to be content with little. And this particular sutta also includes that as one of the ten. So there he says that a person is content, in this case a monastic, with any kind of robe 
arms, food, lodging and medicines and provisions for the sick. And this contentment also serves as a protector. So I had a very beautiful day today because um, not only was I immensely inspired by this morning's Dhamma talk and just seeing my teacher again and being able to share um, you know, that wonderful energy with everybody here and see some of you also getting inspired, but also I received a gift and uh, generosity is another aspect of virtue. But this gift was a particularly special gift. It came in a beautiful cardboard box and I opened it up to find a set of robes, which is a very precious gift for a monastic especially. But it seemed really special because this came from another monastic, in fact, a bhikkhuni who is now sadly disrobed. So I found this really touching, you know, in the sense that, okay, this person has, um, uh, let's say, mm, stepped away from the training for now of the life of a bhikkhuni, which is a very ethical, beautiful, harmless life. But on the other hand, she's made this beautiful gift of something so rare and precious. There was also an arms bowl there. There was a, a jacket and a little beanie and a scarf, everything in the right color, you know, in this kind of ochre color. And, uh, and by making that gift of something so special, she's giving someone else a chance to take up the training. So I realized just how poignant and beautiful that was, you know, that somebody had lived such a virtuous life and um, it gave me an opportunity to rejoice in that. She was a very good bikini and continues to serve the Dhamma. But now I have all these other requisites that I can share with someone else and help someone else live a beautiful life of harmlessness and the higher virtue, the higher training um, through living a monastic life. But another thing that was lovely and I brought it in to show you is that um, one of the robes came in this little bag and this little bag has the essence of the Dhamma embroidered onto it. Here it is. Can you read that? <laughs> so for those who can't read that, it says, abstain from evil or from bad, unwholesome, unskillful deeds. Cultivate good, goodness, virtue, generosity, harmlessness and purify the mind. And the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, I think this is the very first verse in the Dhammapada, if I'm not mistaken, that this is in, in fact the essence of the spiritual life. So that was really very um, beautiful and touching for me. But then I asked myself, you know, how does virtue arise? And I made this connection between spiritual friendship and virtue. Now, in the A4 path, it begins with right view. So in a sense, right view is the beginning for us. And right view is an appreciation of the fact of suffering, you know, the universal reality of suffering. Sometimes I've met people in my practice life who've said, why do you meditate? I don't need to meditate. I don't suffer. People who meditate must be suffering, but I'm okay. <laughs> And good, you know, great. I'm happy if somebody is not undergoing severe suffering at any particular point in time. This is the aim, isn't it? That we don't suffer for no good reason. Um, but I did meet one traveler once and he was determined to convince me that he could avoid suffering at any cost. And if one place wasn't, you know, agreeable to him, he could travel somewhere else. If one relationship didn't work, he could kind of change that relationship and get a better one. If he didn't like the food, he could get better food. And he was convinced that he could somehow wriggle around and avoid suffering at any cost. But the beautiful thing about the Buddha's teachings is that he doesn't ask us to avoid it. He's actually asking us to make use of the suffering that's inevitable and that we have to face simply by being alive and to somehow learn to understand its nature, learn to understand its universal aspects, you know, that all of us, will experience suffering, whether it's physical, psychological, or even more importantly, existential, the suffering of life and death, old age and sickness, the things we really cannot avoid and that we all share in common. And by avoiding that, or by trying to bypass it in some way, first of all, you reap weariness and frustration because it's impossible, but I also feel we miss the meaning of life. And um, another teacher, Ajahn Brahm's disciple, Ajahn Brahmali, was with us for the last five days. 
And uh, two of the best questions that were asked during those five days, in my opinion, were the same question. What is the meaning of life? And uh, a couple of people asked me it in person as well at the end of the talk. And I said that for me, the meaning of life is actually learning to make use of this suffering in a really beautiful way to engender the qualities and responses, actions based on compassion, based on really connecting with that suffering, developing empathy and a wish to free others from suffering. And the acts that should follow from that, because compassion, loving kindness, all of these right attitudes that come next in the path are not passive states of mind. They're not things we only cultivate on the cushion, but actually the more we cultivate them, the more we incline our minds in those ways, the more our actions of body and speech are naturally um, going to be for, you know, out of compassion. We're going to actually engage in compassionate acts even when it's difficult to do, even when it's difficult to do, even sometimes at some kind of sacrifice, you know, it might be um, self-sacrifice to some degree, it, or at least it might seem that way. You know, we can make ourselves a little bit tired sometimes, trusting that when we reflect on what we've done and the benefit that um, has been caused for other people, it's actually worth it in the end. And of course we have to balance that, but that's another talk. That's an entirely other talk. But the reason that I connected this to spiritual friendship is because I noticed today through the inspiration of this morning's session, and of course, having this very beautiful, trusting relationship with my teacher, Ajahn Brown, I instantly felt inspired and incredibly supported. And as a result of that, the path came alive. You know, it comes alive and it gets a little bit flat. And, you know, in a practice life, it's never going to be only kind of up and up and up. Um, sometimes we need a boost. And for me, I got that boost. And I noticed that as a result of that spiritual friendship and being inspired by the qualities that I um, viscerally felt, you know, exuding out of my teacher, Ajahn Brown, I started to feel kinder and more full of metta, more full of compassion and more generous in my thoughts and my actions towards others, even though here we're in silence, but still my whole disposition seemed to change. I mean, I'm not saying it's black and white that I was really grumpy and horrible, Hope, hopefully not. <laughs> and now I'm, you know, angelic and perfect. I don't think it's that um, obvious or that polarized, but, um, but, you know, we get inspiration from hearing the Dhamma from those who practice well. And of course, it's only through our spiritual teachers that we even hear about right view. So this is how spiritual friendship is not only a kind of portal into hearing the teachings and being able to put them in practice, but it also gives us something to aspire to, something to emulate, and just some kind of uh, it is like a transmission, I feel, you know, we can resonate with the qualities we see in others and those same qualities get watered, as it were, in our own hearts and minds. So um, Kalyana Mittas, spiritual friends, they know about suffering and they're able to teach the path to the end of suffering in a really meaningful way because their whole um, lives are now founded on compassion and non-harm. And in this way, the ethics becomes much stronger, the virtue becomes much stronger because it's motivated correctly. It's motivated by kindness, by letting go, or if you like, generosity, renunciation, and also by compassion and metta, loving kindness. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to make this point that these three motivations, these three right intentions, the second factor of the path, come together they're not separate earlier today somebody was talking about you know an experience of deep meditation and um recognizing you know that there were things that had to be let go of and the fear that can arise from that you know when something does suddenly disappear and afterwards it's as if the sense of self comes back and goes no I, i'm not ready to let go of this you know what's going to be left if i if there is no self but uh, if we practice metta and compassion alongside the letting go, then what is left is the metta and compassion. We're not letting go into a void, you know, a sort of empty, dark, cold space where there's really nothing there. 
all we're letting go of are those aspects of what we take to be a self that burden us and cause us to suffer. You know, all we're really letting go of is those coarser habit patterns of the mind, the habit patterns riddled with the hindrances. And have you noticed how, you know, any thinking really is um, co-joined with hindrances? Usually our thoughts are about, you know, things we want or things we dislike in the sensory world. Right, the hindrances of craving, aversion, restlessness, doubt, and uh, drowsiness are very much based on the sensory world. And they manifest in the mind, you know, in our meditation. They manifest also as thoughts. Even if our thoughts are wholesome, because this is a retreat about silence, okay? <laughs> Even when our thoughts are wholesome, still, there's a little bit of restlessness there. The mind is not yet deeply content and the more we can really make peace with the moment you know the more virtue we have in our mind the easier it is to be with ourselves right to be with ourselves in a kind and gentle way and actually befriend the moment and uh, even befriend the silence so that silence feels like a, a safe and warm place to be so then the mind can start to quieten down and uh, this is how mindfulness starts to arise. So it's much easier to uh, sit down and meditate and have the mindfulness that's helpful arising, that's free at least of the coarser hindrances when we've been living our lives in a skillful way. You know, when we perhaps bring up some of the beautiful qualities that we're developing on this path and that we've started to notice uh, inside ourselves. We bring that up at the beginning of the meditation, along with the mindfulness. And we already have a beautiful vehicle which will take us deeper into the practice. So we establish mindfulness first of all. And then the Buddha says we, um, depending on the sutta, but even in the Satipatthana Sutta, it begins with the breath. Quite often it begins with the breath as one of the very first of the body contemplations. So by now we have these lovely qualities and attitudes and skillful dispositions towards the breath. And we're able to treat the breath as a friend. You know, we have a degree of humility in our minds. I don't know if you noticed this today, but I was really inspired also by Ajahn Brown when he kept thanking everybody here. <laughs> he was teaching the meditation, but then he was thanking us. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he was kind of sacrificing his time and his sleep, his rest. He hadn't rested all day long and thanking us for the opportunity to teach. And I found that so beautiful. You know, it's as though the more uh, the wiser and the more respect worthy a person becomes, the more humble they become. They don't require respect. In fact, they respect others regardless of whether we respect or venerate them. And if we can have this attitude of humility, another aspect of virtue, towards our meditation, towards even our breath, this breath doesn't belong to us. We don't own it. We can't command it. You know, we can't expect it to come at our will. But instead, we can be grateful when it does arise. And we can even thank the breath for being our very best friend. You know, we can say that the Kalyanamitas are our best friends, and that's true in so far they can start us off on this path. But as long we can only practice as long as we're alive, as long as our bodies are breathing, right? And the Buddha said that the best death contemplation is to be aware that this could be our last breath. Every breath could be our last. Whenever the breath goes out, we really don't know if it's coming back in. I don't know if you notice, but sometimes there's a pause between the breaths. The breath goes out, there's a sense of release, and then there's a moment there before the breath comes in. For me, it's a little less clear between the in-breath and the out-breath. It tends to go out pretty fast. But there's a, a pause there too, a very subtle one. So if we can really start valuing the breath and start, you know, allowing the breath further quiet in the mind, we start to see more and more of this thing we call breath in a completely new light, in the light of kindness, the light of gentleness, and also that sense of humility. And as we see the breath, 
you know, through these kindly eyes, it starts to appear more beautiful. And at this point, the meditation starts to take off because we no longer have to kind of will the breath or nudge the breath, the, the mind, sorry, onto the breath. That breath becomes a beautiful place to stay. It becomes a quiet place to be. You know, even when we're observing the sensations in the body, have you noticed that usually they're pretty quiet? Unless you have a horrible gastric condition like me, where I burp quite a lot, I'm really grateful for the mute button, I must say. <laughs> I think so far I've managed to hit the mute button before the gas came out. But even so, you know, it's not a, really an offensive noise, right? It's not like speech that can harm. It's just a noise. It's just part of nature. It's just the wind element doing its thing. But on the whole, the feelings in the body are silent. You know, we can actually tune into them with the feeling part of the mind, with the mind that's much more receptive than the mind that's chattering away. And of course, the breath too is very silent. And the more the breath, the mind calms down, the quieter and subtler the breath becomes. And this is where mindfulness starts to reach new levels. So this is how the mindfulness starts to increase you'll notice a direct correlation between the hindrances becoming subdued or overcome and the enlightenment factors arising. And the first of those enlightenment factors is mindfulness. This is now mindfulness, not as a preliminary kind of mindfulness, just to get the meditation going, but a mindfulness that constitutes a factor of awakening. And this kind of mindfulness is powerful and is directly proportional to the absence of hindrances. So the hindrances, again, the craving and aversion that pull us away from the moment, that stop the mind from being able to actually move inward. Ajahn Brown today talked about this fallacy of progress. He said, actually, the right word is ingress. We're not moving on. Craving takes us on. Aversion takes us on sometimes into an imaginary future that's, you know, full of terrible catastrophes, the worst case scenarios, and you name it, you know, you've thought it. Um, both of these are very close to ill will. Uh, we don't like this moment, so we crave for something better. You know, we are bored, we're frustrated with this moment, so we want something better. Again, they're both the same, two sides of a coin. And when they start to subside, we start to be able to remain present and that mindfulness gets a chance to really become empowered to the point that it starts to really see what's going on. And interestingly, both in the Anapanasati Sutta, the discourse on mindfulness of breathing and the list of awakening factors, that mindfulness leads to joy. In the enlightenment factors, it leads to some investigation, first of all. And in general, we need this investigative faculty to remain present throughout. We need to know the difference between wholesome and unwholesome states, you know, to incline towards, for example, the silence, for example, the um, gentleness rather than the force. Yeah, it doesn't matter if we still have thoughts. We don't need to get tied up with them or carried away. You know, thinking never ends, does it? It goes around. It goes round and around and circulates, usually huge circles around the truth. The truth is somewhere in the middle. The thoughts just spin us around. Um, but we don't need to worry about it too much if we can find that point of reference inside and we can start to appreciate the silence. The two can be there simultaneously and whatever you focus on or give importance to and value tends to grow. So as those thoughts start to subside, the silence increases. As the silence increases, the thoughts disappear. Even if they're there, they're kind of just like, you know, little kind of background noises like the birds in the sky or something. They're there, but you don't need to worry about them. It's just the yakka, yakka, yakka of your conditioned mind. It doesn't really, you've heard it all before. There's nothing really original that you can think. And as Ajahn Brown said earlier, and I've noticed for myself, most of my thoughts just come from what I've heard from other people or what I've read. I don't think there's anything particularly new. You know, that's the beauty of giving Dhamma talks. We're giving a, apparently a new Dhamma talk, but really it's just saying the same thing in different words. And the purpose of this is to get us to look inside. So when these hindrances subside and the enlightenment factors grow, and also when the breath quietens down, piti, joy, 
rapture and sukkah, sometimes translated as happiness or bliss or pleasure, start to arise. And these are the kind of happinesses that arise from the mind. They're not uh, caught up or associated with sensuality at all. And because of that, the senses actually start to quieten down. We don't need sight, sound, smells, tastes. We don't even need to feel the body in the sense of touch because the happiness starts to come from the mind. And if you can just notice that happiness that is arising in the mind, it's a subtle shift of focus because quite often in the beginning, you'll feel it in the body as well. But if you can just notice the quality of the mind, there's something there as well. The mind isn't in any place. The mind is something that's beyond space and time. But there's some quality of the mind that is tangible. If you notice peace, you know, the quality of peace, it's not really in the body, it's in the mind. Sometimes the body can be in pain, we can be sick, we can have chronic gastric conditions like I do. And yet the mind, when we look at it, can actually be quite bright. And this is an important distinction because at this point, you know, in the breath meditation, the mind starts to take over. The happiness that's arising is actually born of the purity of the mind. It's actually arising when the hindrances subside. And the more we can notice that, the more we can give, um, the energy starts to go into the mind. And at some point, even the breath can disappear. So when this happens, don't be afraid. It's part of the process. And you might start to see the mind brighten up. You know, for me, it often starts by becoming quite soft, um, quite kind of shimmery, perhaps. And then uh, it can gradually brighten and the mindfulness really gets strong. And when the mindfulness gets strong, again, it kind of tends to see more and more in whatever it's looking at. It sees more beauty, it sees more profundity, and it gets drawn in. So this is in brief the kind of process of the practice. And I did want to talk a little bit about working with thoughts, but um, I think for now, it's probably enough to say that when we develop wholesome thoughts and wholesome attitudes in our daily life, our minds are generally moving towards having thoughts that are fairly benign. You know, the hindrances, the coarser hindrances arise less, and the thoughts are generally more associated with restlessness than craving and ill will. But even if you have thoughts of craving and ill will, don't worry too much. Once we start to meditate and you start to be aware of the feelings in the body, you can just ignore those thoughts. This is one of the methods the Buddha um, described. He said uh, the first method was actually substituting unwholesome thoughts for wholesome thoughts. And that's really helpful if you find that you're just going down a negative track. You know, you can just substitute, for example, a thought of ill will or irritation with a thought of loving kindness. Or you can, perhaps you're feeling sad, you're feeling um, a sense of grief or even despair. And, you know, perhaps you can have a thought of compassion to yourself. One meditator recently told me that whenever they experience suffering, they have a thought of compassion for themselves, but then they also have a thought of compassion for all other beings who are suffering in the same way, which I thought was really beautiful and really connected to the Four Noble Truths, to the truth of suffering, because what we're trying to see there is not only our own suffering, but the universal nature of suffering, the fact that we're all brothers, sisters, and everything in between, gender non-binary siblings, in old age, sickness and death, in suffering essentially. So whatever we experience, other people do too. And that can engender thoughts of compassion. So this can be really helpful to substitute those thoughts from time to time. And it's easier to do probably outside the meditation. Inside the meditation, if you wish, you can take up thoughts of loving kindness as your main meditation object. And I found this a very beautiful way of developing mindfulness, obviously co-joined with kindness because it's the practice of metta itself. And, you know, otherwise, just see if you can allow those thoughts to, to be there in the background, but don't give them too much importance. It's natural to have a thinking, busy mind when we've been working really hard, myself included, and, uh, you know, 
traveling around or whatever, making all your arrangements to settle down for the retreat. Uh, maybe today, well, I don't know about you, but we had plumbing problems here. So we had to figure out what we're going to do about that and write messages. And <laughs> So, you know, it's natural that there's going to be a little bit of disturbance, but see if you can start to incline your mind to the, to the beauty of silence. And at first it seems dry, at first it may even seem intimidating to some extent, or maybe you don't even notice it because it's just a millisecond of quiet between the thoughts. It doesn't matter. See if you can soften towards that silence and treat it as something really precious, really worth attending to, worth listening deeply inward toward. And you'll start to notice there's a beauty to it. There's a joy in peace. There's a joy in stillness. And that joy is of a different type than the joy that we find in the world. So I should stop here. And I hope that there was something in there for everyone. So um, <laughs> it's like trying to give an overview of the whole path in half an hour. <laughs> but hopefully um, this speaks to some of the things that we might be experiencing at this point. And now it's time for any questions that may have arisen, related or unrelated to the theme. Um, so please, again, send your questions to any Q&A. There'll be a couple of moments to do that. And maybe if you wish to, have a stretch. And uh, we only have half an hour. These evenings are fairly short, but... Um, if there's anything I can't get to this evening and it's really pressing for you, please feel free to write it again for Ajahn Brown tomorrow morning. Okay. So as soon as Annie has a couple of questions for me, then I shall come to the chat. And remember, every moment's precious. So while we wait, you can still have a couple of quiet, simple breaths. Okay. Ha, huh. great couple of questions coming in. I had a breath as well, <laughs> but not a diaphragmatic breath. So the first question is, can you tell us something about diaphragmatic breathing? Can it be used during practice? Thank you. That's an interesting question to me at this time in my life, because I actually have um, a weak diaphragm, which has caused a hiatal hernia, which is rather a problem because it means the stomach is kind of pressed while I'm sitting in meditation. This creates quite a lot of discomfort and acid reflux. So one of the things I'm working on is strengthening my diaphragm um, through breathing deeply into my belly and allowing the whole kind of belly and lower rib cage the diaphragmatic area to expand and not just to expand outwards but also to expand kind of to the sides and it's useful to actually breathe slightly deeper for this so I try to do this as a practice outside the meditation because it does involve a little more um, gentle control I would say or let's say intention intentional breathing so we can breathe in for example for five fairly slow counts, you know, in two, three, four, five. We can hold it as well if we're able for a few counts, five or seven at the most, and then breathe out again for five or up to eight. And this can be actually really settling for the nervous system. It's often taught in uh, breath work. There's all kinds of schools of breath work these days, but it can be very, very settling if you are sort of moving into fight or flight or even freeze. Um, and of course it has health benefits too. But uh, for the meditation itself, I think really the more we train with proper breathing methods, because it is really healthy to, you know, take proper breaths rather than breathe shallowly into the lungs the more that will just become natural for us in our meditation as well. But we don't need to focus on where we're aware of the breath in our practice. If we do that, it becomes a little bit too body-based. 
So the very beginning of the practice, you might notice, you know, whether you feel your breath in the diaphragm or in the, in the chest or at the tip of the, just underneath the nose. It's okay to be aware of that, but don't focus on the location. Try to just be aware of breath. And one of my teachers, Shyla Catherine, she has this really beautiful description of the difference. And she says, it's just being aware of the bare occurrence of the breath. This is what we want to do to move the mind towards stillness. So not so much the feelings of the breath, although that will be present, especially in the beginning, that's okay. But more and more as the mind settles, we just become aware of the simple fact that we're breathing, knowing the breath coming in, knowing the breath going out. So I would say try to uh, minimize the use of intentional breathing in your actual meditation practice, other than perhaps having a few deep breaths at the very beginning, and then let go of where you're aware of the breath. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> so the next one, like kama, does trauma also carry over from previous lives when we're reincarnated? Yeah, so... Whatever carries over, in a sense, you could call kamma. You know, you could call effects from previous lives. But it's important to know that, I mean, let's see where we can begin with this. One of the things about kamma is that it's helpful to understand how kamma arises now and the effects of the way our, we use our minds the effects that that will have in the future. It's not helpful to look at things that happen to us now and try to work out whether this is because of karma, because of karma in the past, whether this life or a past life. Some people, many Buddhists actually, traditional Buddhists think that everything that arises is due to karma. And this can be quite a cruel doctrine if you apply that to things like poverty or, you know, natural disasters or abuse, for example, and we say, well, it must be due to my kama. We cannot say that. Even the Buddha himself said kama is extremely complicated and very profound. And it's impossible to trace things that are happening now to exact events in the past. Perhaps when we see our past lives, then we can see particular things that may be, you know, connected. To what happens to us now but there are many reasons for things that happen to us now including weather <laughs> so things like natural disasters again right can be caused simply by the elements coming together in a certain way there's no concept of group karma in buddhism so it's not that all the people that were affected by a cyclone had bad karma and had the same karma that's impossible they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time another thing is the three uh, the three humors, actually, that's a terrible translation. I studied Ayurvedic medicine, um, and we have these things called vata, pitta, and kapha, which are basically um, actually functions. They're functional aspects of the way the body works. They're roughly speaking, catabolism, metabolism, and anabolism. So it's like the way um, the body works. Um, and many things like sickness can be attributed to an imbalance in those elements in the body. So again, not necessarily come up. However, if uh, we have had some trauma in a previous life and we haven't uh, resolved that, it may have an imprint in this life. But remember that come is being created all the time. So it's less important what arises now than how we relate to what's arising. And we are creating good karma every time we respond with kindness, metta, with compassion, non-harm, non-violence, gentleness. I'm using synonyms for the same word. And the sense of, um, let's say, not over-identifying with what's arising right now. The word is nekama, renunciation, but it really means um, not um, taking control of these things, not possessing them as ours. So even trauma that's carried over is not ours, you know, it's just an energy that's being, um, that's coming up again for us to work with. It's giving us an opportunity to resolve, to make peace. Um, and we can't really know where it's coming from. We can't really know. 
So everything does, in a sense, carry over, but not all in the same lifespan. I'm sure there's stuff that, you know, we've done in past lives that might not come up in this life, it might come up in future lives. But the main thing is there's a way out. There's a way to end all karma by uh, seeing through this delusion of self. And um, the process of that is by making good karma. We can make good karma and empower our minds and gain powerful meditations to enable us to see things as they are, which includes seeing through this delusion of self. And then the karma from the past no longer has the same uh, effects. That's why a stream winner is no longer able to go to the lower realms. They've actually um, resolved, let's say, any kind of karma, uprooted any kind of karmic residue that could take them to those places. So just checking how many questions we've got. All right, I will speed up a little bit. So I have a question about walking meditation. Should I keep my attention only on the movement of my feet or should I notice also the sounds of the environment or other parts of the body? And is there some moment when I should let go of all of it or let go of it all? I'm enjoying walking, but I'm a bit overwhelmed by so many perceptions. Okay, firstly, I want to resolve one of the issues for you here, which is the should. <laughs> And it's always natural to ask these questions around should when we're not sure what we're doing, maybe we feel new to the practice, and we feel there's a right or a wrong way. But actually, the word should doesn't really um, have much relevance in practice, because often what's happening is just happening due to cause and effect, right? Whatever's happening is natural, it's nature. And there's, it's more like Rather than shoulds, it's more like there's skillful and less skillful or appropriate and maybe less appropriate ways to respond. Let's say beneficial ways, and that can change from time to time. So there's no should. Often the way it's taught is to um, observe the feelings in the feet, not just the movement, but the feelings, the sensations, which can be very apparent um, when we start to uh, allow our mindfulness to, to move towards the feet especially if you've got a nice sunny day and some grass to walk on, you can feel really subtle sensations and maybe not subtle, very evident, interesting sensations in the feet. Um, but sometimes that can become a little bit restrictive if your mind is still not settled enough. You know, sometimes it's more relaxing for our mind to be aware of the, all the moving parts and the feelings in the whole of the leg, for example. Um, you can be aware of the sounds in the environment. At the beginning of the walking practice, it might be nice. It might be soothing to do that, just to give yourself a sense of context, the way we sense into the atmosphere in this room, in this Zoom room, room. But gradually, we just let those sounds be in the background. You know, we just let them uh, fade away to some extent and, and just be aware of the body because that's where mindfulness can develop most easily. So um, if you are overwhelmed by many perceptions, see if you can lower your gaze. <clears throat> that's one instruction that's really helpful. So have a certain length of path, maybe between 10 and 15 steps. If your mind wanders a lot, it can be shorter. If your mind's restless, it can be longer. You can walk more quickly. But um, see if you can keep your gaze just one or two meters in front and be a little bit disciplined about it. The other way to stop getting overwhelmed is to stop at the end of the path and to just settle yourself again, you know, just to calm the mind in the standing posture, maybe bounce a bit on your feet, check that you're grounded, notice what it's like to stand. And when your mind's calm, turn around slowly and start again. So uh, the main thing there is that you enjoy it, which is great. So if you enjoy it, just carry on. Yeah, and the perceptions will start to settle. I mean, in a sense, it's good that you're overwhelmed by so many perceptions because it means that your mind's inclining towards something simpler. So just listen into your mind and see how you can be of service to your own mind. Okay. When I practice sitting meditation, it frequently arises a stinging sensation in my back, a kind of stab. Any suggestion? Thank you so much. <laughs> I get one too, I've always had one actually, not always, because it's there some of the time and not all of the time, but in my kind of just the, below the mm, shoulder blade on the right, I get this like stab sort of really sharp pain going through. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think with sensations like this, the first um, 
way to tend to them is just to see if a change of posture can give a bit of relief. And if not, then it's probably just something that's happening due to muscular, I don't know, tension or a trapped nerve or something like that. And it will probably not harm you in any way. So see how comfortable you can be, first of all. And if it still continues, then it's about learning to relate to it in a skillful way. For myself personally, I try to notice whether I'm avoiding it, whether I'm having aversion to it, because it's interesting for me to notice that. And if so, try to develop a bit of softness and gentleness towards it. If I'm kind of honing in on it, it's usually aversion. It's usually um, this idea that if I kind of focus in, then it might go away. Or it can be just the mind's innate tendency towards this kind of negativity bias that it focuses in on what's difficult. So in that case, I usually widen my awareness. And uh, another helpful thing with dealing with any kind of sensations is just to spread your awareness, to move. Don't stay with one thing, you know, spread your awareness through the body and notice other places in the body where you don't have that feeling. Yeah, that can be really helpful too. If you want to really explore it, there's a validity to that as well. Maybe not when you're trying to get the mind quiet, but if it really persists, you can really investigate it. When the mindfulness is strong, the next uh, enlightenment factor is Dhamma Vichaya, this uh, investigative faculty of mind. So you can go in there and you can stay with it and notice, is it changing or is it stable? Is it stronger in some areas and weaker in others? How far does it radiate? Is it just in a small area or does it radiate to quite a wide area? Where's the beginning? of the feeling, where is the end? Physiologically, so to speak. You can really have a little look and you can also try to be kind, you know, imagine it's like a little child who's coming with a hurting knee, maybe, the, or a child with a stabbing sensation. This can help to um, uh, not to over-identify. And what would you do to that child? You'd probably soothe that child, give them a hug. So in the same way, you can kind of caress that feeling mentally by giving it some kindness and care. But don't stay there too long. Just see if you can, uh, you know, allow it to be and then incline the mind towards something more peaceful. Uh, having the quiet mind, even for just one day so far, has been amazing. Thank you very much. In the tea break, we went for a walk here in the city and were shocked at how loud the city is, especially the subway, which is above ground here. I don't know where you're calling in from, but subways tend to be busy, yes. <laughs> How much energy and brain processing is consumed on a normal basis, filtering out all these normal city noises? Rhetorical question. Yeah, filtering out or just being inundated. Real question. I would like to chant with you tomorrow morning. Where can I find the text? <laughs> okay, so just firstly, with um, the quiet mind that you have, see if you can try to really guard that quiet mind and certainly have a walk, preferably alone or in silence with a companion, but maybe avoid the city for a while if that's possible for you to do, because you don't need to waste mental energy now, you know, and it will have an impact on the mind. The mind gets very sensitive when we're on retreat. And you will be more resourced after this retreat to be aware of your reactions and responses towards the noise. But for now, it's really precious time to be quiet, to be still. And sometimes we can lose some energy, you know, when just as we're making headway. So it's not a problem at all. Don't feel bad about it. But it's interesting you notice, you know, that it does take energy. And gradually, I think in our practice life, we tend to just choose quieter places, even choose quieter people to hang around. So the real question about the chanting is, uh, hmm, so we're going to be chanting the Loving Kindness Sutta in English, which is easy. So it starts, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. So that's the translation we're using. And I'm hoping that uh, it is on our website. I think it should be. Otherwise, if Annie or Minori could post up a link to where you can find it online, that would be great. There's lots of places you can find it. 
and you can chant along with your silence it's such a shame isn't it that zoom doesn't allow us to actually hear each other but you'll all have to chant in silence so Matthias has kindly given the link there that is in Pali but I'm hoping the English translation is there too probably yeah he's nodding his head super all right so this is actually the last question in my little box it might take the remainder of the time otherwise you never know if you've got a question, a little question, you might be in luck. So during the letting go process right before, wanting arose related to trying to control the meditation. And it was quite clear that wanting was directly related to this me wanting something for itself. Excellent. Ajahn Brown says that when there's a self, there are things which belong to the self. But isn't it true that when there's a sense of self, there's also a wanting for that self to achieve whatever? Absolutely. And that's why there are things that belong to us, because we want them. We want them to belong to us. Absolutely. When there's a self, then we want only good experiences or only the experiences we think are good, right? Based on our conditioning, based on our ideas, um, based on what brings us pleasure, and the irony of this is that we don't always know what's good for us. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's a wanting. We think we want this deep meditation. We think we want to control the meditation. We actually don't realize that we're creating suffering for ourselves. And this is the great irony. That's why the Buddha says, you know, what the Aryas, what the enlightened ones say is happiness. The worldlings say is suffering. What the ordinary people say is suffering. The enlightened ones say is happiness. Is that both the same? Or well, maybe it's what the worldly ones say is happiness, the enlightened ones say is suffering. So quite often we want pleasant sights, sounds, smells, tastes and touches, and we want them to be quite intense. Whereas in our practice, even before we become noble ones, we start to see that actually those things are more agitating to the mind. They're not as desirable as we once thought. You know, going to the city, walking in the subway sometimes that's fun it's exciting there's a certain speed going on but after a while the mind inclines to something much more peaceful and eventually you know it's the happiness of seclusion it's, it's even the happiness of letting go direct definitions of the jhanas the deep states of samadhi that are the highest pleasure the highest happiness but yeah the little me want something that uh, makes it feel at ease, makes it feel comfortable. And that's honestly okay. You know, if we push things too far too soon, it can have detrimental effects. So just be aware of when that wanting arises and that control arises and just see if you can laugh a little bit at it. Oh yeah, there we go again. This is what I've always done. It's understandable because there's still a sense of self. Of course, I'm going to control. Of course, I'm going to want. But that's just old conditioning. That's just a pattern. Let me see if I can just relax. Just relax instead of trying to control. And see if I can find some peace with whatever's there already. Because it's the wanting that takes us away from the beauty in the moment. When we want something more, you know the rest. We can't enjoy what we already have. Yes? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We all know this somewhere, but we forget it because that wanting pattern is so ingrained and it's totally understandable. We've been wanting throughout countless lives and, you know, even until we're an anagami, the third stage of liberation, we're going to be wanting something, even if it's the deep meditation, you know, we're still going to be like uh, preferring some experiences to others. So it's quite natural. And just see, you know, the reverse of that. When we want something more, we can't enjoy what we already have. When we don't want anything more, can we enjoy what we already have? Or when we do enjoy and find contentment with what we already have, where's the wanting there? Where's the wanting when we're really content? So see if you can develop more contentment with every little single moment. And that contentment will give you everything you ever wanted anyway. <laughs> so there's one more question and we have four minutes left this afternoon after calming the body and mind 
I directed my mind on how peaceful I felt. My mind became very bright and I got drawn into a feeling of inner joy, which lasted a few hours. In the meditation just now, I felt very at ease, just leaving everything as it is. How to let go more of the one who experiences all of this? Yeah, we always want to do it more, which is okay. <laughs> but actually, I think just allow the process to teach you. Allow the process to teach the mind. And the letting go of the one who wants more of it will naturally start to subside as you realize that whenever we want more, <laughs> whenever the self is there, you know, whenever there's someone experiencing this, it's not as peaceful as when we simply let go without any expectation at all. So quite often, you know, these deep meditations happen as a result of being content again. You were looking at how peaceful you felt. Even if it wasn't very peaceful, I'm quite sure that when you notice the peace that was there, it increased, right? This is how the mind works. When we're really genuinely grateful, gratitude is another word for contentment then that thing starts to look beautiful. It's like if you're grateful towards someone, you're focusing at that very moment on all their beautiful qualities. You're finding something to be grateful for and those beautiful qualities are the thing that you're aware of. They grow in your mind and they grow in that person too when you point them out. You know, I was saying to my friend Venerable Pekka here recently that when, I, when someone says thank you to me, I notice this sense of, ah, I feel so good, you know? I just feel like my work is done. I've done enough. I am enough. <laughs> What's done has been finished. And there's a sense of completion there. So we can say thank you for what's already arisen. And uh, the mind will get deeper. Um, I'm digressing probably a little bit here. Um, so the mind became very bright and I got drawn into the feeling of inner joy, which lasted a few hours. This is very wonderful. This is um, exactly a skillful way for the meditation to develop. And just now you felt very e at ease, just leaving it, it as it is. And really you've answered your own question because this is how you let go more of the one who experiences it. You know, you're just being at ease. You're just leaving things as they are, and bit by bit, they'll start to vanish. And, you know, the more that vanishes, the more of this thing that's experiencing it vanishes as well. It's as though the experiences become more subtle and the mindfulness that's aware of those experiences becomes more subtle in response. And when you really move through very, very deep meditations that Ajahn Brown can probably say more about, the, even parts of the mind consciousness start to disappear. So this is when you start to see that even this one who's knowing is always, is actually very um, ephemeral, you know. Knowing has different qualities of solidity, different um, levels of solidity. Sometimes the knowing, the idea of me being the one who's aware is quite strong, it's quite intense at other times it's very very delicate very very gentle really in the background there so there are differences and I think that noticing that impermanence is a really good way because then it doesn't really matter okay sure you're going to identify with that as yourself but you're starting to see that this self is actually impermanent and through that um, understanding the insight will eventually arise that whatever's impermanent cannot really be a self But that's quite a deep question and quite a deep reflection. So I would just say you're doing fine already. Or let's say the process is happening. So just allow it to unfold. Great, so nice to end with a little comment in the box. Thank you for organizing this retreat, for the teachings and for giving us a chance to meditate together. Wonderful. And I am going to thank you as well for being on this retreat, giving me the chance to organize it and uh, share the Dhamma and also get really inspired. So thank you so much for your kind attention and for your very sincere and beautiful practice. And that's each and every one of you, even if I don't know you, I don't know your practice, 
believe me, it's contributing to the energy in this room. So I hope that uh, we can pull one another along that little bit more deeply inside into the moment, into the mind and into the beauty of silence. So the teaching for the day is ended. <laughs> so I'll be saying good night and uh, just carry on being kind and listening into your body and mind. Do whatever you need to do. And one of my advices is always to practice a little bit of metta at the end of the meditation, but certainly at the end of the day to just give yourself that sense of appreciation, thankfulness, and also loving kindness. For now, you can just generate that loving kindness towards yourself if you wish. And that will, um, yeah, that will just give you some friendship, some warmth, and some encouragement on this path. Okay. Good night, everybody. And we'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow starts at 8.30, so please be here at 8. 15. It's great if you can come at that time because we can let you in and the co-host can settle down nice and easily. Even if we don't let you in immediately, it helps. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Take care.